Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or indeed good evening, depending on your time zone and depending when you are watching this. It's Tuesday the 12th of May 2020. Happy Tuesday. I'm James Innes and this is my daily YouTube show, The Jobs Guru. Please do think about subscribing. In today's show, I'm going to be taking a look at the jobs, careers and employment news. I'll be covering a question from one of my viewers. I'll be talking about a voluntary redundancy, discussing the 15 most common CB writing mistakes and how to avoid them. And critically, we'll be finding out why polar bears don't eat penguins, as if you didn't know. If you have any questions or comments as you watch, then do please let me have them below. And if you like what you see, then do please hit that YouTube thumbs up. So first, as usual, I've had a good read of all the jobs, employment and careers related headlines. And we're going to be having a chat today about this furlough scheme palaver, because that's definitely the main news today. How many people in the UK are currently on furlough? Any guesses? Yes, that was rhetorical. It's six million. Six million people currently having 80% of their wages or salaries paid by the government act as a taxpayer whilst they sit at home and chill. Not my words, but that's certainly some people's perception. This is costing the country a whopping great 14 billion quid, that's pounds sterling for the benefit of my foreign viewers, each and every month. The Chancellor says this is unsustainable, he's possibly right, and he is widely expected, i.e. some naughty people have been leaking stuff to journalists again, to announce a gradual winding down of the scheme today. The Times reports, though, that Boris Johnson has confirmed, perhaps somewhat stealing the Chancellor's uh, thunder, that the scheme will continue to support low-paid workers as it is wound down, and that furlough staff able to return to work already on a part-time basis could have their wages topped up by the government. But many are up in arms about this whole issue, and I think quite understandably. There is a clear risk it could lead to further mass redundancies, particularly in sectors such as hospitality, retail, aviation. I agree with those who say we need to extend the scheme in some form to at least the end of August. Yes, it's very expensive and as a nation it's leaving us with a large hole in our already rather holy pockets. But what's the alternative? This scheme is a brilliant idea and we absolutely must ensure the benefits it has provided are secured and not just blown away. I'm not saying it should necessarily continue in precisely its current form through to September, I'm just saying I hope the Chancellor really does understand what the word gradual means. The Guardian does report that the Chancellor has been urged to extend the scheme until September to avoid spiralling job losses across Britain this summer. And the Telegraph reports that this is a strong likelihood or a distinct possibility. The scheme can't last forever and we can't keep certain companies on life support when they are essentially now dead, no. But I, for one, am very interested to see what the Chancellor has to say later in terms of wrapping up the scheme carefully, thoughtfully and, most importantly, at the right time. Finally, on the news front, I'd like to formally correct a statement I made yesterday. Yesterday, the government published its roadmap for easing lockdown, or as Boris Johnson also called it, a shape of a plan and a sense of the way ahead. Or as some pundits have said, a roadmap with only very vague directions and no ETA. Again, not my words. Anyway, I stated that this was to be a 50-page document. I was wrong. It turns out they actually published a full 60 pages. Now, that'll make for some very interesting bedtime reading for somebody. So, on to that question from one of my viewers. Today, my question is from Jane in Brighton, down on the sunny south coast of England. It's sunny today, at least. And it's famous for its pier, if you haven't been there. Jane's question. I am a freelance copywriter. However, I have lost my main client, a travel firm, because of the ongoing coronavirus situation. This has left me in a bit of a state financially, and a lot of other places I've contacted for work aren't taking on new people. Are there any other avenues of work I can try that you would recommend that would allow me to use my copywriting skills? Well, Jane, um, I am so very sorry to hear this, and indeed all of the very similar stories I've been sent recently. There's been a lot of them. There are a lot of freelancers in particular out there, um, you know, in very much the same predicament as Jane. Fortunately, yes, the government has stepped in with some serious financial assistance for the time being. We were just talking about that. So if you don't already know about that, then please do look into it immediately because, you know, as you say, this situation will undoubtedly have uh, left you in a bit of a state financially, as you say. What with so many freelancers out there in the same boat as you, competition is obviously exceptionally fierce right now. So I think that, you know, being open to exploring other areas is very important. Don't just search for copywriter roles or, you know, on Google or whatever, but look at any freelance or, or work from home opportunities. You may well find something that hadn't at all crossed your mind, but 
obviously be careful to avoid you know the many scams out there work from home is a bit of a dodgy area on, on the scam front um, it's going to be vital to update and enhance your LinkedIn profile, uh, making it clear you're, that you're available now and uh, open to opportunities. And um, I suggest use platforms like Upwork, you know, broaden your search, get your name out there. As it happens, my business, the James Innes Group and the CV Centre is experiencing quite a boom. And we can't get hold of good writers fast enough. So, you know, maybe think of that. There is hope. Basically, in situations like this, when competition for freelance work is ferocious, it pays more than ever to identify your transferable skills and think outside of the box. Now, I'm always open to interesting new questions from my viewers. So if you have a jobs, careers or employment related question for me, then do please type it into that comments section below. And I may well feature it in a future episode of this show. And if I do, then there will be a jobs guru coffee mug winging its way to you in the post, which of course works equally well for tea, uh, even chamomile. Now, each day, as well as answering one viewer's specific question, I always look into um, a specific issue which has been raised by a number of different viewers. And today I shine my little spotlight on VR or voluntary redundancy. Now, voluntary redundancy is a financial incentive offered by an organization to encourage employees to voluntarily give up their job, typically in downsizing or restructuring situations or you know, global pandemics. It's important to note, though, that even if you volunteer, your employer is actually under no obligation to accept that offer. Uh, the purpose of VR is to avoid or reduce compulsory redundancies by allowing those who actually wish to depart to do so of their own accord and also to allow the organization to amend its, its, its employee profile. VR is typically offered to a specific age group and an experience level. Now, if this comes up as a possibility, you should, of course, think very carefully about it, whether it's right for you, especially now, and including how it will affect things like, for example, your mortgage. So it takes, uh, give it some good, serious thought before making any decisions. Now, on to the main topic I wish to discuss with you today. As you may or may not know, I've written a few books. In fact, I am the UK's best-selling careers author. Amongst my titles is The CV Book. Yes, I literally wrote the book on CVs. And it is, as they say, available in all good bookshops. Within that book, there is a particular chapter, The 15 Most Common CV Writing Mistakes and How to Avoid Them. And I'd like to run through these with you today. So I've seen thousands of CVs, many thousands of CVs, covering pretty much every possible kind of job. Uh, a huge variety. The difference in them is vast, but the same common mistakes crop up time and time again. Too many job seekers are missing out on their dream job because of a fairly small number of easily avoided blunders. Now, some of the people, uh, you know, some mistakes that people make when writing their CV are pretty obvious and others are much more, more subtle. My business, the James Innes Group, trading as the CV Centre in the UK, has conducted a pretty comprehensive analysis of over two and a half thousand different CVs to derive a top 15 of these mistakes. So I have the list here. I'm going to run through them one by one. Um, I would say they're in no particular order, but that wouldn't be true. Actually, these are more or less in order of either priority importance or uh, how frequently they're seen, basically. So number one, lack of an achievement section or lack of achievements full stop. Including achievements in your CV is absolutely vital. Recruiters need to see the ways you have added value in your previous roles. The actual contributions that you personally have made. Without that information, you're not going to stand out from other candidates who might have similar experience. Now, obviously, these achievements work best if you can A, quantify them, and B, weave them into your experience um, or career summary section to provide context. Numbers stand out on the page. Numbers often speak louder than words. Recruiters, you know, will pick up on these right away. Um, but again, they'll understand them better if there's context, i.e. if they know uh, what job role you're performing when you deliver that huge sales growth or that significant cost reduction, whatever it may be. Number two, a CV not being tailored for a specific job role. Well, one size fits all is not applicable when it comes to CV writing. Many recruiters now use applicant tracking systems, ATS, which are typically configured to identify keywords relevant to the job. Even if you are applying only for, say, project manager positions, different companies may be looking for different specific key skills. So it's vital to tailor your CV each time, even if this is you know, it's just adding a few odd tweaks, to add, you know, adding in some more of those more keywords, basically. Um, three, missing or inappropriate email addresses. And I've linked this in with, no pun intended, with um, not having your LinkedIn URL on there. Um, and I'm not having a LinkedIn uh, profile at all would be even, an even bigger mistake, but of course most people do. Anyway, so having no email address uh, on your CV is clearly a problem, but it's not something I see very often these days. 
more problematic and far more common is the use of fun or jokey email addresses. Now, these are going to be fine for corresponding with your friends and family. But from an employment point of view, you know, I'd go for something more serious, more professional. You might have the perfect CV, but if your email address is Mr. Loverman at example.co.uk, then it may harm your chances. Um, and I'd say it's important to include also uh, a working URL to your LinkedIn profile. It's vital to have a LinkedIn profile, but then do include the, a link to it from your CV. That's a really nice touch, I think. A majority of recruiters now use LinkedIn to source candidates and find out more about someone, so make sure they can find you easily. Four, uh, lack of proper professional profile. A professional profile is a brief statement at the very beginning of the CV. I'm sure you probably know this. And in the space of a few short lines, it is supposed to convey to readers an overall impression of your key personal and professional characteristics. It's essentially a, an introduction, and it should give readers an interview, uh, sorry, an overview, uh, before they read on in further detail. Very important to include a sufficiently detailed, but not overly detailed, detailed, but very carefully phrased professional profile. The reader needs to know instantly what you're about and what sort of position you're looking for. And, uh, going back to the previous point there, or the, the point before actually, uh, this is also a key area to consider tailoring for different applications. Number five, length. This is one of the most common problems I see when people prepare their own CVs, they're quite simply too long. I've seen CVs over 30 pages long, true, yeah, and with photocopies of all their certificates on top of that. It's not an autobiography, it's a curriculum vitae, it's a lot shorter. Now, if it's possible, a one-page CV can have a huge impact, and, and some recruitment agencies, and headhunters in particular, may insist on a one-page CV. But as a general rule, a two-page CV is about right for most people, at least in the UK, and that should give plenty of space to highlight those achievements I, I, I just mentioned. In certain circumstances, yes, you can go to three or more pages, but that's only really very senior or, or some particularly technical posts, uh, medical, for example, engineering, the, the teaching possibly. These are the exceptions which prove that two-page rule. Number six, spelling, grammar, and typos. You might think I'm stating the obvious here, but you know, research at the CV Centre has shown that I think it was 60% of the CVs we received contain linguistic errors, more than half. It's impossible to stress enough how important this issue is. Spelling and grammatical errors are amongst the most irritating errors a recruiter sees, or a CV writer, amongst the most damaging errors you can make, and are also amongst the most easily avoided. Check, check, and check again, and then have someone else check for good measure. Seven, the inclusion of photographs. People often include photos of themselves on their CV. Don't. Not in the UK, at least. Unless you are applying to be a model, you want to work as an actor or an actress, and most of us probably aren't doing that, including a photo with or on your CV is definitely not recommended. The whole point of a CV is that the recruiter has a brief, factual description of your abilities and skills. Photographs will, rightly or wrongly, give the recruiter that opportunity to develop a preconceived idea of you as a person. That might well count against you. Maybe they've got an irrational aversion to, to facial hair, for example, whatever it may be. An interview is uh, the most appropriate place for the recruiter to first see the applicant, not the CV. Eight, still with me? Inappropriate heading. Your CV should be headed with your name and just your name, boldly and clearly before any other details, contact details, etc. It should not be headed curriculum vitae or CV or anything else, just your name. And only your first name and your last name, not your whole name. Um, well, you might want to include any particular prestigious post nominals, um, but you know your name should still be more prominent. Use a smaller font, font size for those. True, yes, traditionally CVs were headed curriculum vitae or such like, but that convention's very much gone the way of the dinosaurs, and that's probably a good thing given how frequently people misspell curriculum vitae. You'd be surprised. Um, number nine, superfluous personal details in the CV. Um, our clients often feel it's compulsory to include details such as marital status, date of birth, nationality and ages, uh, children, dependents, whatever. Yes, it certainly used to be the norm to include this sort of information in the CV, but it's now increasingly rare, um, particularly given modern anti-discrimination legislation, specifically the Equality Act of 2010, to find these sorts of details are on a CV. They simply aren't relevant. Too many candidates get too personal. That seems a major problem. A recruiter doesn't need to know whether or not you're married, how many children you have, where you like to go on holiday, what your partner's name is, what you normally have for breakfast, whatever it is. It's too personal. These facts should not affect whether or not you can do the job. They simply clutter up your CV and make it harder for recruiters to get to the key information that they really do need to see. 
Uh, there's also security, uh, identity fraud risk as well. If you volunteer this sort of highly personal data to, to all and sundry, you know, if your CV happens to fall into the wrong hands or whatever. It's exactly the sort of information an identity fraud fraudster will need to clone your identity. 10, uh, a lack of clear section headings or separation of sections. It's vitally important for your CV to be easy for the reader to scan quickly and to this end, uh, clear section headings, separation of those sections is absolutely essential. I often recommend lines or other graphic devices, but there's plenty of ways of achieving a, a nice clear separation. Uh, and it's also very important to consider how many different sections you want to include. Um, you know, considering what I mentioned before about how important it is to keep your CV concise, be ruthless about what content makes the cut in your CV. For example, don't include a section dedicated to uh, IT skills um, if all you can list is Microsoft Word and the internet, for example. Number 11, use of personal pronouns. Okay, so the words I and me are often used repeatedly in uh, homemade CVs. Either that or he, she and his, her by people opting for the third person perspective. The most professional CVs are exclusively written without the use of any form of personal pronouns. You know, using I and me or he, she and his, her, it, it looks unprofessional. It, it, and it can also convey an impression of, you know, arrogance and egocentrism. I this, I that, I the other, me, me, me. But most of all, it's just too informal. It doesn't read well. It might seem unnatural for you. I can understand that to write a document about yourself and yet never use either I or me. But recruitment experts conclusively agree that this is the best way to do it. Number 12, inappropriate section order. It's extremely important to choose an appropriate order for the various sections of your CV. For example, the decision whether to put your educational qualifications before or after your career history, that's critical. It all depends really on what your greater or greater selling point is. Uh, you should make sure that all your most uh, important information is conveyed on the first page or for a one page CV in the top half of the page. Um, now, what do you think is going to be like to be of more interest to prospective employers? Is it going to be your educational qualifications or your career history? You know, think it through. Um, we're on to number 13 there. Right. No bullet pointing or too many bullet points. I'm squinting. I'm going to need to get glasses soon enough. No bullet pointing or too many bullet points. In today's fast paced world, recruiters no longer have the time to read large, solid blocks of prose. They need to extract the information they need and they need to do it fast. Long paragraphs of prose are tiresome for a recruiter to read through, and as a result, many just simply won't bother. This is where bullet pointing comes in. Unfortunately, many people fail to use it to their advantage. Now, I don't recommend you use it absolutely everywhere. I would, you know, I wouldn't use it for your professional profile, for example. Do write that as a solid block of prose. But I do very strongly recommend you use it in your career history. Number 14, almost there now. Reverse chronological order not used. Now, it's a standard convention on CVs to use reverse chronological order, i.e. to present your most recent information first, followed by older and consequently less relevant information. Most people do get that right, some don't. I would strongly, strongly suggest you make sure your CV conforms to this. Mo many people do find it you know, illogical. They don't feel comfortable with the idea, but look at it this way. Should the first job you ever did, for example, um, I don't know, working in a pub to support your studies or something, really be the first thing that a prospective employer sees when they're looking at your career history. If you're now a managing director or something, it's going to look a little, little irrelevant. And when they look at your, in fact, if you're a managing director, it shouldn't be on your CV anyway. But still, when they're looking at your education qualifications, do they want to see your GCSEs first, you know, that you sat 10 years ago, or the Masters in Applied Communication that you completed three years ago? You know, they want to, recruiters are most interested in what you've done most recently. That's what's most important to them. Sorry there, cat just uh, knocking uh, something off the table. Um, number 15, and finally, excessive details of interests. You should aim to keep your interest section brief, if indeed you include one at all. As with the other aspect um, of your CV, include what you feel will count in your favour, but be selective about it. Many people write far too much in this section. Um, obviously, boring things like socialising or clubbing, which might actually not be boring of, them, of themselves, but they're boring on a CV. Uh, avoid those sorts of things, and you know, it gets the impression you're going to come into work hungover on a regular basis. And even if you do plan to go into work hungover on a regular basis, it's best not to advertise the fact. Um, I'd advise against travel as well, you know, unless you really want to work in that sector, which is probably a little, little tricky at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, you know, that's one to avoid too. Choose carefully. Um, Maybe you do have a passion for model railways, but do you really want the recruiter to know that? So there we go, all 15 points there. 
uh, the 15 most common CV writing mistakes. Naturally, I would really welcome any thoughts, questions, ideas, comments you may have in the comments section below. Like, you know, make sure the cat's out of the room before you start filming, James. Um, please, comment section down below there. Um, now, in each episode of this YouTube show, I'm going to be taking questions from another one of my books, the Interview Question and Answer book, and looking at how to answer them. And all this week, I'm going to be taking questions from the chapter which is entitled Weird and Wonderful Questions. Today's question, why don't polar bears eat penguins? Similar questions include why do butterflies generally come out uh, during the day and moths generally come out at night? That is the right way around, isn't it? Yeah. And um, is a tomato a vegetable? Or, or is it tomato a fruit? Those who watched yesterday's program might think this question is along the same lines as, as the question I discussed about monkeys and chandeliers. Um, but technically, this is actually a general knowledge question. Polar bears don't eat penguins because, because polar bears live in the Arctic and penguins live in the Antarctic, which isn't exactly next door. There's a you know, little way between the two of them. However, when an interviewer is asking this sort of a question, they're not really expecting uh, the majority necessarily to, to get the right answer. They don't really, and they don't necessarily care if they do. In fact, they're more interested in how you react and how you think your answer through. So yes, unless you know the, the, the correct answer, this question is actually quite similar to, to, to yesterday's question about monkeys and chandeliers. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, then you know, flick through and have a look at yesterday's show. Uh, so how to answer? Well, because they can't get the wrappers off, boom, boom. Yes, well, that would certainly be one possible answer. Um, let's face it, you're, you're probably not a zoologist. So you know, this is one occasion where demonstrating a sense of humour, not to mention some lateral thinking, wouldn't do you any harm. I certainly know of at least one candidate who did answer in that fashion. But assuming you don't know the correct answer and you're not a budding comedian, um, the best answer is to, to give is, is it's gonna be along the same lines as that, that monkey and chandelier question. You demonstrate your ability to analyse the situation, identify possible theories. Um, so anyway, I've drafted a possible little uh, example for you here. Um, so I'm afraid I'll have to admit that biology isn't one of my strong points. I do enjoy watching documentaries, but I haven't seen one yet which would give me the answer to this question. Um, I can think of a number of, number of possible hypotheses. Maybe penguins are too small for a polar bear to bother with, and they stick to larger prey. Maybe polar bears aren't fast enough to catch a penguin. Perhaps there's something toxic about penguins. Good thinking. Some form of defense mechanism, maybe. Maybe polar bears live and hunt inland, but penguins spend most of the time in the water at the water's edge. I obviously don't know Chafor, for, for sure, but these would be my, my possible ideas. So uh, am I close? Now, as it happens, I am currently updating uh, this book, the interview question and answer book, working on a brand new edition. So if you have any interview questions which you think I should be considering for possible inclusion, then do please let me know uh, again in the comments section below. Love to hear from you. So now, uh, that's pretty much all for today. Just uh, two more things. First, the usual YouTube requests. Uh, if you have any questions or comments about the show, then obviously, you know, let me know about this show in general or indeed about life, the universe, uh, herpetology, whatever it may be, do please let me have them. If you like this episode, then do please hit it with that YouTube thumbs up. And do think about subscribing to my channel if you haven't already. And if you have, then do please ring that bell as usual, anything for a cheap laugh, so that you can receive notifications when I upload new episodes. So finally, let me tell you what's happening tomorrow. In tomorrow's show, I will be chatting about a variety of things, including the gender pay gap, and seeing how much water it would take to fill St. Paul's Cathedral. I do hope you'll tune in. Thank you for watching today. Keep safe and be well, my friends. Goodbye.